after centuries of peace between the mage and the regular people. Mordred, the mage, decides that peace is no fun. Let's give war a chance. He attacks the Britons with dark magic, giant war beasts, and a huge army. By the time he gets to Camelot, it seems like it's all over for King Uther. His brother, Vortigern, tells him to surrender, but Uther goes, hold my crown. He would accept surrender. Hold the crown. Then he simply finds Mordred and ends the whole mess with one swing of his magical sword, the legendary Excalibur. Camelot should be back to peace time, but it's not what happens. Mordred and a few others are still punishing the mage people for what Mordred did. Sir Bedivere speaks to the court and defends the mage. He reminds the king that it was one of them, Merlin, who gave him the Excalibur. They are not bad people. They just had an evil leader and now he's gone. Someone mentions that Mordred and Mordred were once classmates in the same sort course, which was a diplomatic move back then. King Uther agrees with Sir Bedivere and decides to stop all aggression against the mage. His brother doesn't look so happy about that. In the middle of the night, King Uther wakes up his family in a hurry to flee the castle. I made you to do. I tell you. Camelot is burning outside. Vortigern is also leading the way to his own wife, but he's not trying to protect her. They creep down a secret path that leads to a dark pit under the castle, and there he ends her life. Unfortunately, Uther's wife has a similar fate soon after. Someone attacks the family when they reach the docks. Their little boat looks empty and it floats away. Untie the skiff. Eventually arriving in the big city of Londinia. Some women go check inside and guess who's there? A deeply traumatized crown prince. But for those women, little Arthur is nothing but a poor little orphan. So while Vortigern becomes the new king, Arthur is raised in a busy brothel, having a very rough childhood, patiently saving every coin he's given and watching in silence when the customers get violent. He ends up much more streetwise than he could have ever been as a little prince in the castle. As little Arthur becomes young Arthur, both his patience and his silence just vanish. Tough training takes up most of his days while his nights are filled with nightmares about his mother and a burning city. Back in Camelot, Vortigern wakes up to a little surprise. The water is mysteriously gone from around the castle, which revealed the Excalibur stuck into a large rock. Get them back for water. Sure. Very upset about that, the king goes to that shady pit again. He's there to talk to the siren, a chatty sea monster with a few attached ladies. The king starts whining about the deal they had. He gave up his own life in exchange for power. So how come that sword is showing up now? The siren says balance is inescapable. When any power grows, the opposite power must follow. She's basically saying he should have read the fine print. Also, it was him who managed to lose both the boy and the sword that night. If he wants to control the sword, he needs to find Arthur and get rid of it. The siren then says that if he needs any extra help, he already knows the price. You know the price. At the brothel in Londinium, Arthur is a grown man now. He takes pride in looking after the ladies who once looked after him. That means someone is going to pay for these bruises on Lucy's face. In fact, that someone happens to be a Viking and he has already paid. Arthur gives her money bags with the equivalent to a year's work. Lucy asks how come he made a Viking pay that much, but he prefers to leave that part to her imagination. Then the back legs arrive. They are King Vortigern's guards and everybody hates them, probably because of this habit of pestering people about the resistance. It seems that one of the rebels attacked the king's boat upriver, and there's reason to believe the guy is hiding here. Not sure you're to welcome him, mate. They describe both the man and what would happen to those harboring him. Arthur identifies the person of their interest, and the guards take him away. But the black leg sergeant stays a little longer. The truth is, Arthur has been putting those savings to good use, which includes having a few important people in his pocket. The sergeant wants to speak with Arthur and his friends. Black, lack, and wet stick. At first, it looks like they're in trouble. But what's really happening is just that he's giving them a heads up. The king is getting annoyed, but the recent rumors about the boy King, and some graffiti about that has turned up. Man is so popular, I'm surprised I don't. They deny any knowledge about it, but everyone knows a little boy who's been drawing stuff like that on the walls. That boy's name is Blue, and he is Black Lack's son. And then, on top of all that, the sergeant warns Arthur that those Vikings from before are under royal protection. It could get ugly if they tell anyone about their not-so-friendly visit earlier today. And that's just an up and quick play. Arthur doesn't seem too worried about any of that. In the castle, a black leg officer named Mercia is talking to the king about the same stuff. Since the sword showed up, there's been a rise in incidents and graffiti about the born king. Vortigern calls Maggie, a woman from the oldest family in the kingdom, to ask her opinion on all this. She says that people love him, but her face is telling a very different story. That's the thing about being a ruthless tyrant. 
She's from one of the oldest families in England. You'll never get an honest opinion from anyone again. The king tells Marcia they need to finish the Tower of Camelot. And when they do, none of this will matter. Bordigern's magical powers are connected to the tower as part of his deal with the siren. At the brothel, Backlack wakes up Arthur telling him to get out. The Blacklegs are coming for him. He escapes through the window but ends up running into some of them in the street. They check his wrist for something called the brand and he doesn't have it. So they put him on a boat with a bunch of other guys in the same situation. When they arrive in Camelot, we see what they mean by the brand. Tired of sleeping with an eye open since the sword resurfaced, Bordiger is forcing the entire male population to take the Excalibur test. Then we go, what are you? If you pull it with both hands and nothing happens, you're free to go. And to prove you have already passed the test, you get branded. Arthur simply ignores the very long line of dudes and just walks up to the rock. Some black legs are just chilling nearby, happy to have been assigned such an easy task, since this born king stuff was probably all nonsense. Then Arthur grabs Excalibur and it comes out with no effort. There's even a minor earthquake. The black legs stare at him like, oh no he didn't. But it turns out they don't even need to lift a finger. Arthur is neutralized by his own sword. Passing out with all that energy at once. That's very convenient for Bordigern. By the time Arthur comes to his senses, he's locked up in a dungeon, and the king already knows everything about him. Arthur says he's just another brothel baby. Not royalty material at all. He'll just drift away, never to be heard of again. The king doubts that, because now he has his coffers and knows about all of his achievements. If he gathered all that power as a common orphan, what's he gonna do now he's the born king? Somewhere in the kingdom, another interesting conversation is taking place. A beautiful lady in a dark hood pays a visit to Sir Bedivere. She's a mage sent by Merlin to guide the born king. And she's asking Sir Bedivere to help her. Do you know who I am? Arthur is taken to the king, who seems to be getting ready for a battle. He says there are thousands of people outside right now, and they're here to see Arthur. Everyone is talking about the born king. Instead of asking him why all these people can't wait to see that crown on a different head, Bordigern sees an opportunity to put on a scary show. At this point, the guards bring Lucy to them and end her life, just to show Arthur what's going to happen to the others if he doesn't cooperate. Marcia and Mischief John start the presentation, bringing the so-called born king before the crowd. He's offered Excalibur to defend himself, and the people are disappointed to see him refusing to take it. Their mood is shifting fast now, and they haven't come all this way for nothing. So everyone starts getting ready for an execution. What they don't know is that the mage and her friends are also there, blended in. And those are just her human friends. The mage has a deep connection with animals. That's why we see an Horses and dogs have gone crazy. It's a complete chaos, and the guard's priority is to protect the king. So this is the cue for the rebels. Percival and Rubio cut Arthur loose, get the sword, and then run for their lives. <laughs> Arthur's taken to the rebels' headquarters, and he tries to hide his surprise to see Bill there, safe and sound. Sir Bedivere is there too, and he's not a very tactful person. He tells Arthur that the Blacklegs have torched his home, and now he has no life to get back to. The rebels are anxious to see Arthur in action. So they start provoking him. He's completely aware of what's happening, but he bites anyway. During the fight, the Excalibur kicks in again, and his eyes go all turquoise. You are resisting the sword. Before he passes out, images from that night start coming back to him. He wakes up to the mage working her voodoo around the sword. She tells him to stop resisting the sword, and the bad dreams will go away. As he remains resistant to face his past, they take him to the Dark Lands. That's a place hidden in a distant island where rats are the size of a pony and the bats can carry a full-grown man for miles. That seems to be the rebel's idea of a crash course, and it does work. All beaten up and certainly scarred for life, Arthur gets the sword to the stone altar, where everything clicks together. He finally remembers what happened to him that night. There's a skull-faced creature right behind them at the docks. That's who hits the queen. King Uther leaves the boy inside the boat to fight back, but Skullface wins. Uther flips up the Excalibur in the air, and when it falls back, the king is turning into stone. Skullface comes closer, and he's also transforming. He's now back into his human form, which of course is that scheming traitor, Bordigern. The rock that used to be Uther falls into the ocean, carrying the sword away. After this extreme therapeutic intervention, Arthur is rescued from the island. The mage tells him the rest of the story then. Bordigern didn't take Camelot because of political differences with his brother. He was always a two-faced rat. When he studied magic with Mordred, he talked him into the dark stuff, promising to share the power once they took over Camelot. Then they started acting out their plan. Merlin forged the Excalibur and gave it to the Lady of the Lake. She gave it to Uther, and since then, the sword is bound to his bloodline. When they get back to the headquarters, Arthur's old friends are there too. They all get together and plan a hit on the king. As 
Camelot is too heavily guarded, they decide to lure him into the city by sabotaging the construction of his tower. The only problem is that Arthur and the Excalibur are not getting along yet. Every time he touches the sword, he gets a bunch of flashbacks, but no extra power like it used to happen to his dad. Still, they stick to the plan, and in a few days, they have a surprise visitor. It's Maggie, that woman from the oldest family. You need to be careful. She came to tell them that Lord Adjourn will be here in three days, and he's coming by boat. She also tells them to be careful. His power is growing fast. Now that they have some more data, they can plan the attack in detail, but it's still a long shot. Literally, it's a 170-yard shot from a window in the only building they can get it. Also, keeping the hope of getting out. Bill says he can do it, but as the others seem to doubt it, he shows them twice. When the day comes, everything seems to go as planned. Arthur even says it looks too easy. That's because the whole thing is a trap. They have a decoy king standing there, pretty much wearing a target on his back, while the real king is still on the boat, having a little chat with poor Maggie. But remember, our heroes used to run a business in a big city, and it's not so easy to trick them. Some are infiltrated among the crowd, and they signal to Bill, indicating the trap. However, it turns out that once Bill has the bow and arrow, nothing can stop it. He's plowing them though. He earns that. Not even his own friends, frantically begging him to. Marcia is right there at the docks. And the opportunity is just too good to miss. He shoots the arrow. It takes a moment for the guards to understand what's going on when Mercia falls. But soon, they're all over the place, frisking everyone and shouting orders to close the gates. Arthur's gang try to escape unnoticed, but end up engaging in a chaotic battle. Rubio and Blacklack are badly hurt and must be left behind. The rest of them make it back to Arthur's old home. He urges everyone there to run away, but they don't want to. They hate the Blacklegs, and they've been training their whole lives for a day like this. When the guards swarm the place and an ugly con- front is about to start. Arthur sees that one of them has the mage. For the first time ever, he's not like before. When he snaps out of it, he's taken all of them down single-handedly. People are watching from the windows, and there's this whole born king vibe in the air. Arthur is not just a legend anymore. They make it to the safe house, and Blue asks about his dad. Wet stick tells him he's fine. He'll be here in a minute. Not that stupid. The boy runs off. He finds Black Lack and brings him to the others. Wet stick says they must go right now. While there's enough fog to hide their boat from view. Black Lack asks for a minute to rest, and the moment they leave him, Bordiger just waltzes in. One of his dogs followed the scent there. He starts to interrogate him while they're all getting on the boat. Blue comes back for his father, and Arthur comes after him. Bordiger finishes off the man in front of the boy, who screams in anger. Arthur has to carry him to their boat. All over the city, the people start to fight back against the Black Lacks. They believe in Arthur now. Bordiger orders his men to crush the resistance tonight, ignoring the fact that it's looking less and less doable. Thinking of all the people lost to the legend, Arthur tries to get rid of Excalibur, but the Lady of the Lake puts it right back into his hands after showing him a glimpse into what's in store for Camelot if he gives up. He's their only hope. Back in Camelot, we find out that Rubio is alive. He's being held for interrogation while Arthur is with his friends in the woods, planning to attack the castle. The Blacklegs find the rebels' headquarters with the information finessed out of Rubio. Mischief John is the only one there when they return. Blue and the mage have been taken and everyone else is done for. I'm ready. He delivers the message from the king. Arthur must be at the castle before dark if he wants to see the hostages again. That night, Vortiger looked very uneasy to see only Sir Bedivere. He wants to trade the Excalibur for the mage now. The king agrees under the condition that Arthur himself will come tomorrow. Once she's free again, the mage works out her magic and conjures up a snake. Arthur agrees to get bitten to receive a protective venom. While he's on his way to the castle, the eagle is flying the snake there too. Arthur turns himself in and Vortiger takes the Excalibur to execute him. That's when the snake attacks. But Vortiger is faster. He almost giggles, proud of having frustrated that little magical plan. That smile is totally gone though. When the snake's mom comes by, she takes care of all the guards inside the castle, but spares Arthur because he's got the venom in him. Vortigern also survives that visit. He goes up to his daughter's room, finishes her off, and then takes her to the siren. (laughs) Arthur picks up the Excalibur from the wall. Piece of cake for him. He walks outside and wipes out the guards, but not all of them, just the dumb ones. The smart guards take a step back and drop their own swords. They have a new king. But the old one is not ready to go yet. He has turned into Skullface and is waiting for Arthur at the unfinished tower. What he doesn't realize is that the connection of the tower itself with the Excalibur makes it all click together, just like in the Darklands. Now, in the full control of his sword, Arthur finally defeats his uncle and the tower comes tumbling down. Lord Adjourn's reign of terror is finally over. After getting all his mates knighted, King Arthur goes on to focus on a little DIY project of his. You can now kneel. 
he's trying to put a round table together. And this is the end. This was a recap of the 2017 movie, King Arthur, Legend of the Sword by Warner Brothers Pictures, starring Jude Law and Charlie Hunnam. So what do you think will happen next? Is Arthur going to be a good leader? Or maybe he should have left that for someone with more experience, like Sir Bedivere. Let us know in the comments below with hashtag CinemaRecap. Until next time.